Bismillah wassalatu wassalamu ala rasulillah my dear wonderful people assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah i received a question from a lady who is organizing a day trip to brussels from london england and uh, some people have told her that you cannot do that unless you have a mahram so first of all let me define to you what is a mahram the mahram there are two types of mahram there is the travel mahram and there is the marriage mahram the marriage mahram and that is when an adult male and adult female are either talking or going out whatever they need to have a mahram that is to make sure that nothing of uh, indecent happens this type of mahram a little child who knows the difference or what could happen has a uh, knowledge of sexual the world whatever happens between a man and a woman is enough for example a girl of 9 years of age or 10 years of age could do here as a mahram another girl can do here as a mahram so this is completely different than the travel uh, traveling mahram which by uh, islamic legislation is required to be a male now before going into the issue of uh, is it permissible or not why is a mahram required it's not because islam doesn't trust a woman and anyone who thinks this kind of thinking is ill it's really they must go and have their head examined and that is predominantly because the woman in the way allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created her is not somebody that can cater for all the demands of uh, that the trip requires and this becomes very clear when we look at the hadith reported in sahih al-bukhari where rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam says as-safaru qit'atun min al-'adhab yamna'u ahadakum ta'amahu wa sharabahu wa nawmahu fa idha qada nahmatahu falyu'ajjil ila ahlihi as-safar is a piece of punishment of the adab because it prevents you from your food from your drink and from your sleeping so as soon as you finish off your business go back quickly to your family and this hadith is in sahih al-bukhari so as such a woman traveling alone is going through a painful punishment and this, this is all to us mankind when we travel it never is fun it always is hardship and troubles and problems and all these things of the expectancy at the time of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam travel was not as comfortable as it is today they were in camels and all that kind of stuff and uh, there are about four to five hadith that i will mention now where different people came to rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam asking him about uh, the legislation of a woman traveling alone so let's start with this first hadith an abi said in al-khudri radiyallahu anhu qal قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم لا يحل لمرأة تؤمن بالله واليوم الآخر أن تسافر سفرا يكون ثلاثة أياما فصاعدا إلا ومعها أبوها أو ابنها أو زوجها أو أخوها أو ذو محرم منها هذا الحديث في صحيح البخاري ومسلم أبو سعيد الخضري رضي الله عنه reports that رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم says in the meaning of this hadith here that it is not halal for a woman that believes in Allah on the last day that she travels alone three days and more except that she has a mahram with her that is her father or her son or her husband or her brother or another mahram from her i.e like grandfather uncle and so on and so forth this is in al-bukhari and muslim in this hadith is three days and up and the next hadith again abu saeed in al-khudri radiyallahu anhu who reports that rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in al-bukhari and muslim again لا تسافر امرأة مسيرة يومين ليس معها زوجها أو ذو محرم but a woman should not travel two days or more without a mahram that is her husband or another mahram i.e. a brother and uncle and the father and things like that another hadith also in the sahihain i.e. al-Bukhari al-Muslim that Ibn Umar رضي الله عنهما أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال لا تسافر المرأة ثلاثة أيام إلا مع ذي محرم a woman must not travel two days and more except with a mahram this is again in al-bukhari and muslim on ibn abbas radiyallahu anhu ma qal qal an-nabiy sallallahu alayhi wa sallam la tusafiru al-mar'atu illa ma'a dhi mahram wa la yadkhulu alayha rajulun illa wa ma'aha mahram so here in this hadith abdullah ibn abbas radiyallahu anhu says again in al-bukhari and muslim that a woman is not allowed to travel without a mahram and that no man should enter uh, to her house without her having a mahram with her and there are so many other ahadith that have come to report that a woman should not travel 
and it gave a number of days, like three days, and we saw two days. And as for those who prohibit a woman to travel alone, is the hadith reported by Abdullah ibn Abbas, Allah be pleased with him, لا تسافر امرأة إلا مع ذي محرم A woman must not travel except with a محرم And uh, this issue about traveling has always been again Like music, like so few other issues Always a matter of uh, debate So here in our age Where our scholars have looked at the evidences And anyway, in the past The scholars have said That the different hadith Of the number of days and things like that were based on the current situation and circumstances at that time. So when Rasulullah for example, was asked, is a woman allowed to travel? And he said three days, because the circumstances, the war and the problems that happened there, Rasulullah would give the fatwa according to how things were there. And all in all is to safeguard the woman in her journey from A to B. As I mentioned earlier on, this matter or this issue here has been a matter of disagreement between scholars since the early days. But sadly today, the only Islam we get in here in the West comes from Saudi Arabia. And as I said it many times before, when it comes to the women affairs, Saudi Arabia and their scholars are not an authority for that. There is Egypt, there is Kuwait, there is a great number. And for your information, now in Saudi Arabia, there is a law a national law, which says that women do not have to rely on their wali, which means husband, brother, father, and all that kind of stuff, if they need to travel. And the wali does not approve of that travel and does not give them the permission to issue a travel document, passport, or anything. These women can go to the court of law and apply for a document, and by law they will be given this. The permission of the wali al-amr is no longer required in Saudi Arabia. There is also another lady called Iman al-Nafjan, who is also battling it out for women to drive in Saudi Arabia, because nowadays the extremists, they make it haram on a woman to drive. There are no evidences. How did they come up with that? But the issue these days is when these scholars give a fatwa, they give it like it's that's it. That is the only way. And the other problem that we are facing today is that when they give a fatwa, they make you feel like if you go against it, you are an innovator. There is a consensus, they say. Well, actually, there is no consensus. A sheikh, al-imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, alayhi rahmatullah, he says, any scholar, man al ijma'a faqad kathib. Whoever pretends that there is a consensus on a matter, has actually lied because look we have 14 centuries of scholars where do we put them all ibn taymiyyah agreed ibn qayyim al jawziyah agreed and a great number of scholars say a woman can travel alone if she feels it's safe for her this is the final cut and this is the final talk let me tell you now of the condition that our scholars and i don't mean the saudi people i mean the scholars of islam from the Sahaba until our time. They agreed that initially a woman shouldn't travel alone, and that is for her protection, not because we doubt her or anything. However, if it happens that she needs to travel, either for a compulsory duty or for any other matter, the very first thing is, or she takes permission from her husband, or if she is single, from whatever it is next to her, so that they know that she is traveling. And if it is not possible for her mahram to go with her, she can go by herself. And in this case here, if she travels in a group or anything like that, it's always better to do it. Especially that there are authentic ahadith in al-Bukhari where Rasulullah prohibits the traveling of a man by himself. As it is reported on the authority of Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu, and the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لو يعلم الناس ما في الوحدة ما أعلم ما صار راكب بليل وحدة and this is in Al-Bukhari if people knew what there is like the evil that there is and when you do things by yourself no man would have trouble at night by himself so that is in Al-Bukhari and this is for a man so what about a woman so as you can see here Islam comes to protect the woman and uh, as is always the case when people want to push something down your throat and force it in, regardless of what, they will always find excuses as to why the other evidences are not authentic. Take, for example, this hadith in Al-Bukhari, 
where Adi ibn Hatim al-Ta'i radiyallahu anha one day was with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and a couple of people came to complain to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about the hardship that they were finding in their travel. And then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam turns to Adi radiyallahu anha and he says to him فَإِنْ طَالَتْ بِكَ حَيَاتِ لَتَرَيَنَّ الظَّعِينَةَ تَرْتَحِلُ مِنَ الْحِيرَةِ حَتَّى تَطُوفَ بِالْكَعْبَةِ لَا تَخَافُ أَحَدًا إِلَّا اللَّهِ قال عادي فرأيت الضعينة ترتحل من الحيرة حتى تطوف بالكعبة لا تخاف إلا الله الحيرة is in Iraq today and this is what Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم told عادي that one day you will see a woman traveling from الحيرة to مكة performing حج and she goes back again and she feels only Allah our scholars جزاهم الله خير when they spoke about this matter they said this is the woman who in that time there will be safety on the street and things like that and women will be able to travel alone without fearing anything. But why did Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi mention Al-Hira when there were nearby places that Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi could have said Al-Madina. He could have said any other place. Where Al-Hira is southeast to Baghdad. It's, it, it, Al-Hira is the southeast to Baghdad. And Baghdad is about 1,718 kilometers by car, it would take you 16 hours and a half to get to Mecca. So as you can see here, there is a big deal of differences between the scholars. The final point is that each time, each circumstance is independent. For example, if you are, say, living in North Africa, in Algeria, for example, where the, uh, I would not let my cat, female cat, travel alone, let alone my sister or my mother, in that circumstance there, when we are asked, is a woman halal for her to travel in that land? The answer would be, no, it is not halal. Why? Because for a fatwa to take effect, there is no size fits all fatwa. For a fatwa to take effect, our scholars always look at two components. One is the time and two, the circumstances. And this is how they give the fatwa. So we cannot apply what happens to Saudi Arabia here in London where we have the car or in Europe and things like that. And this is also the same thing when we speak in general. So here when we are in England, there are fatwa by Sheikh Ben Baz, Ibn Uthaymin, Salah Al-Fawzan, Al-Ubaykan, and many others that have agreed and said it is okay for a woman to travel by herself a distance of a day and a night. So they want for the minimum of a day and a night, and it is halal, it's permissible. But in Saudi Arabia, again, when they give the fatwa, they cover up. It's just like it's consensus. Everything is consensus there. When the leader of their madhab, Imam Ahmed, says anyone who claims consensus is a liar. Music is haram. Traveling alone is haram. And so many things are haram. But uh, you, when you listen to them, you think that that's it. Islam is that's that. But actually, it's not. Many scholars have agreed to that. Al-Qaradawi, alayhi rahmatullah. And many other, Al-Azhar now in Egypt, many scholars. But again, as it is always the case of this kind of scholars, is when someone doesn't follow their point of view, they straight away label him as mubtadi, as an innovator, as a deviated, as someone who is following the weak things. So in any way, to keep the topic really short, and I've mentioned enough hadith in here, if a woman wants to travel alone, let's say in England here, if she has gone to Birmingham, that is an hour and a half, and she's got an AA membership, and she's traveling daytime, go to Birmingham and come back. If she wants to leave to Birmingham at 7 p.m. at night, I would say, no, you cannot travel alone. I'm sorry, that is not permissible for you. Why? Because her safety is at stake. If someone says, uh, want to leave from London, a group of sisters or women want to leave from London to go spend a day in Paris and come back, where's the problem in that? That we're going to take the plane, and they are together, and today with the plane, there are the, the, the hostesses and all this kind of stuff. And you get there, there are cops, cameras and everything. You go and come back. You are far more protected. Provided you don't put yourself in a situation where either you get raped or get uh, a thief will attack you or you'll be mugged or something like that. But as long as you take these precautions, for the love of Allah, who would want to prevent that? Who would want something haram when it is halal? So if Ibn Taymiyyah was today with us, you would take every case independently. You tell him and you'd say this. So if Ibn Taymiyyah was today with us and Hassan al-Basri and uh, Nawawi and all these people, they are, that's, they are mubtadi'ah, they are people who don't know about Islam. Allah al we live in funny days. So my sisters, go have a nice trip. 
travel, enjoy yourselves, stay safe, and come back uh, home safe. Islam is a beautiful, and this also applies to any lady whose husband cannot travel with her, and she goes with a group of people, do have fun. Again, this is your brother, Abdul Salam Abu Ahanifa, and sallallahu ala nabiyina Muhammad, subhanaka Allahumma bihamdik, ashadu la ilaha illa anta, staghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. And this is the middle path that I follow and will meet Allah upon. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.